Well, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, uh, Isabella and Lou for the, for the invitation. I will jump straight in and be as concise as possible so that we can make up uh, the lost time. So we'll be covering why should grandmothers be involved in FGM programs? So what's the evidence base? Why are grandmothers not usually involved in FGM programs? Uh, including what are the risks of not involving grandmothers? And then I'll pass over to Judy and she will present how the Grandmother Project has successfully involved grandmothers to promote abandonment of FGM in Senegal. And finally, lessons learned from that uh, program, which we think are relevant uh, to other FGM strategies. So why is it so important to involve grandmothers in FGM programs? Well, our argument is grounded in a systems change approach to social and behavioral change, and more specifically, a family and community systems approach. And this takes into account that girls, adolescent girls, are embedded in broader systems. So the family system, the community system, and the cultural system. And all of these levels of the system are connected and interrelated. And they involve values and roles that people traditionally lead and authority and power structures. So second, uh, practices like FGM are cultural ideals, and they are supported by social norms. So social norms are mechanisms that reinforce a cultural ideal. They involve uh, rewards, informal rewards, when people conform to the cultural ideal, and informal sanctions for not conforming. And social norms are a collective phenomenon. So people don't take uh, decisions as individuals as if they're not influenced by anybody else. Instead, they care deeply about what other people think about, think of them and what other people do. So in non-Western societies characterized by collectivist values, people often want to conform and they value the sense of belonging that comes with being part of a group. And in such contexts, it's very hard for individuals to act independently against these dominant cultural ideals, given the pressure, but also desire to conform. So that gives us a really big challenge. You know, how do we shift behaviors that are grounded in social norms? Well, according to a system change approach, it is imperative to engage the people who perpetuate the social norms and have power and authority over those norms. So if we, to go to the next uh, slide, please. In relation to FGM, one of the key categories of people who have a huge influence over these social norms is grandmothers. So I have to explain this very briefly, but there is a wealth of evidence that shows that grandmothers play a key role at all levels uh, in relation to FGM. So at the center of the diagram, you'll see a girl or a woman who is cut. Beyond that, you have the executors of the practice and associated rituals. We know that this is predominantly older women. Uh, sometimes it's called traditional cutters in the literature. Despite this phenomenon of medicalization, where the practice is done in healthcare set settings, it's mainly done by uh, older women in the community. Then you have decision makers within the household or family and extended family. Again, uh, this is often female elders, grandmothers and aunties, and their authority can often trump that of fathers and mothers within the household. This is really important to appreciate, um, particularly because in these societies, uh, gender intersects with seniority. So seniority is biological age and position in the kinship structures. So the more children you have, the more grandchildren you have, the more authority you have. Right. Then you have influences of social norms. So people who, for instance, stig stigmatize or ostracize uncut women or who praise or reward uh, cut women. Again, we know that grandmothers play a really important role here, but as do religious leaders, male elders uh, and other community members uh, more broadly. So next slide, please. Given the wealth of evidence in favor of uh involving grandmothers, why are they not usually involved? And they really aren't, because we've done a, a review of uh, policy reports uh, relating to, to who are the actors who are normally solicited as change agents within FGM programs. And we've found a phenomenon that I call grandmother exclusionary bias, which refers to the systematic exclusion of grandmothers or female elders as change agents in social norms change interventions in favor of youth, women of reproductive age, men and boys and male traditional or religious leaders. So how can we explain grandmother exclusionary bias? Why does this, why are programs not working with grandmothers despite the evidence that they wield authority and the systems change argument that it's authorities who should be engaged? Next slide, please. 
So what are the explanations? We've identified a number of explanations. So one is this so-called risk group focus within public health. And this is a tendency of public health interventions to engage the people who are at risk of a particular health issue rather than the people who contribute to creating that risk. Another phenomenon is what we'd call a girl-centric focus in development. So a lot of uh, resources are invested in activities uh, that seek to achieve girls' empowerment. Now, while that is uh, a good thing in itself, 15 years of evaluations of programs show that girls by themselves cannot challenge authority structures in their communities particularly effectively. It is imperative to work with family and community members more broadly to create a supporting environment. Um, a number of negative assumptions occur relating to grandmothers. So the first is this, is this assumption that grandmothers have no influence over FGM. We've shown that they do. Uh, this is based on an understanding that FGM is a patriarchal practice and therefore men have control over it. However, in the case of FGM, uh, FGM is a form of bargaining with patriarchy, which means that women benefit from it and it gives them, uh, it enables them to bargain vis-a-vis -vis men. Um, so because women gain from the practice in their cultural contexts, these senior women uh, have control over it and promote it. Second assumption, uh, that grandmothers always support FGM and are committed to perpetuating this tradition, while younger generations oppose it. This is not necessarily the case. In a recent project that I, I did in, in Mali, uh, our study found that actually the support uh, among younger generations and elders was pretty much the same at 70% in the areas where they were working. Uh, so you have to do a study in whatever context you're working in to understand uh, different levels of support. Finally, uh, there's this assumption that grandmothers are incapable of learning or changing their minds or abandoning tradition. And we know again from our experience that this isn't uh, always the case. So the next slide, please. Uh, the next slide is a quote from oh, nice. anthropo anthropologist Bettina Shell Duncan. Um, and so she says, while strong value is placed by grandmothers on upholding tradition, uh, can everybody make sure they're muted, please? Uh, so while strong value is placed by grandmothers on upholding tradition, there's also an appreciation that elements of tradition must be revised to meet fluctuating realities. And rather than resisting change, some older women express an openness to reassessing norms and practices. And Bettina argues that by recognizing older women as potential change leaders, it may be increasingly possible to design programs that will shape possibilities for action and accelerate abandonment of FGMC. And she has come to those conclusions from her own studies independently of the Grandmother Project, but this is, like, is exactly what the Grandmother Project does. So uh, my final slide, please, Judy. Uh, finally, this is the risk of not involving grandmothers. Uh, so as briefly as I can, a lot of FGM programs are based on the tipping point model, based on the work of Everett Rogers' Diffusion of Innovations. This is the idea that a Innovators in a community will introduce a new behavior, in this case, abandonment of FGM. They will inspire the early adopters. The early adopters will inspire the early majority. They will inspire the late majority. And at the end, you have these laggards who are people who might resist the change. Now, often FGM programs will work with the innovators and the early adopters. You might have heard of this idea of positive deviance and hope that they will inspire others. Unfortunately, we know that this Tipping point theory doesn't necessarily work in practice because a chasm emerges between the innovators and the early adopters and everybody else. And this is because social norms aren't being addressed. And so according to systems theory, as I said, you have to engage the authorities to bring about systems wide change. Right, so and those authorities in this case are the so-called laggards. We don't particularly like that term. It's quite has negative connotations, but the point is you need to be working with these authorities who are resisting change as a priority in order to bring about systems-wide change. But this requires particular methods. The methods that might resonate with your innovators and early adopters aren't gonna resonate with your laggards. You need specific methods. So I'll hand over to Judy now, who's going to explain how the Grandmother Project has uh, developed and implemented such methods. Thank you, Annika. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, Lou gave some introduction to Grandmother Project Change Through Culture. Um, The mission of Grandmother Project is to promote the health and well-being of women and children, especially those who support community-giving South Africa has changed. 
Colleagues, there's someone. Uh, could you please unmute yourselves if you're not right. speaking? And you're always bragging about it. We know that we have the source. The parties in South Africa are crazy. And that I'm able to I think that otherwise, maybe Judy, you should. Oh, I think it's the, uh, the person muted themselves. Okay, sorry. Okay, so the, the mission of Grandmother Project is to promote the health and well being of women and children, especially girls, by supporting community driven change that builds on community resources cultural values and traditions. Um, I think very often in development, our, our initial thoughts are uh, related to what is it that we want to, what change is it that we want? Oh, this is advancing by itself. What is the change that we want to bring about? I think often we don't give adequate attention to the cultural context. And so I wanted to start with this quote by grandmother Tobo, who is um, who has something to say about the importance of culture to communities. She states that culture is the most important thing for an individual. You must know your own culture, otherwise you will be influenced and absorbed by someone else's. I think Tobo's statement, I think Tobo's statement uh, calls our attention to the importance of culture from the perspective of the community and the need to understand and build on what exists. So, uh, so we have developed uh, an approach that we refer to as change through culture. The pillars, the key pillars of this approach are building on cultural values and structures, recognizing and involving elders, especially grandmothers, given our work with women and children, strengthening communication between generations, strengthening community leaders' knowledge and skills, using community education methods based on dialogue for consensus building. And we have, um, oh, it's not advancing. We have uh, applied in Southern Senegal, we have used the change through culture approach to deal with what we refer to as girls holistic development, which includes addressing girls education, child marriage, teen pregnancy, and female genital uh, FGMC. Um, as I was, as I as mentioned a minute ago, I think uh, there is increasing awareness of the importance of uh, of, of developing programs based on cultural context, but also the awareness that often there is, th this is not the case. And the UNFPA report in 2008 uh, concluded that international development agencies ignore culture or marginalize it at their own peril. And similarly, the world, the WHO in, uh, wrote that the neglect of culture in health is one of the biggest barriers to improving the health of communities worldwide. I think as regards uh, the the gap, uh, as we see it, between perhaps between cultural values, roles, structure, gender, and power dynamics, and the policies programs uh, used to uh, promote change in in uh, in communities, a major facet of or major element of uh, uh, in this related to this gap is the neglected facet of African cultures, which is the role and influence of elders, specifically grandmothers. Um, I think there is a, a growing concern and, and awareness about this, the fact that elders and grandmothers specifically are not taken into account. And Professor Sal from the University in Dakar has written that in all African societies, elders have a privileged position. He goes on to say that grandmothers have primary responsibility for health and development of women and girls. And specifically related to our discussion today, he writes that grandmothers can be a cultural lever for changing social norms related to child marriage and to FGM. Anthropologist, Nigerian anthropologist Amadume, um, in her important book on reinventing Africa, matriarchy, religion, and culture, she writes that 
she critiques Western feminism that focuses on the matriarchy while ignoring the power of the matriarchy. And she asserts that senior women, African context, enjoy respect and exert influence, especially within the domestic realm. So um, in uh, Southern Senegal, as I said, uh, we have promoted a, uh, a change in, in these several social norms using our child, our uh, change through culture approach based on the need to create a supportive environment around girls, based on the realization that grandmothers play a leading role in socializing girls, also based on the realization that grandmothers have power and influence over men in families to a greater or lesser degree. And so these, uh, based on these se several elements, uh, the rationale for, in for an inclusive approach that involves three generations of men and women, elders, adults, adolescents, traditional and religious leaders, community health workers, teachers. So um, our theory of, of change at the outset from the left to the right was to use a, uh, an inclusive and participatory strategy to promote open communication and to increase social cohesion between the generations and between the sexes in order to one, increase girls' self-confidence and empowerment, and simultaneously to promote changes in the attitudes of family and community members toward girls' holistic development. The combined uh, effect of, of these uh, elements of the strategy to, pro to produce, to promote positive change in attitudes and social norms related to girls' education, child marriage, teen pregnancy, FGMC, and also to gender roles and relationships and to promote communication between the generations. So um, the community-wide uh, process, which aims to promote consensus for change in girls' holistic development, as I've just mentioned, is an inclusive pro approach it's a dialogical approach that draws on transformative learning methods from adult education to build collective consensus for change. And it's an intergenerational approach, as I just mentioned. Um, think very often communication strategies identify different uh, community actors who are directly and indirectly related to the issues addressed. And often activities are directed at them, activities, messages, et cetera. The unique feature of, uh, of the change through culture approach is uh, the different activities that elicit dialogue and, and that build consensus between different categories of community actors. And very briefly, uh, just to illustrate these different activities, a foundational activity are the intergenerational forums, sometimes with large group discussions often with homogeneous small group discussions of elders, of adolescent boys, of adolescent girls, mothers, grandmothers, days of praise of grandmothers, all women forums, girls that involve girls, grandmothers, mothers, and female teachers, under the tree participatory learning sessions involving girls, grandmothers, and mothers, grandmother leadership training, girls' leadership training based on African values, grandmother teacher workshops, and lastly, days of dialogue of solidarity and solidarity. All of these activities contributing to building consensus, building co social cohesion and consensus for change. What have been the results? What can we say about the results of this, uh, this approach? Uh, in 2019 and 2020, a large evaluation, a, com a, a quantitative component, and a, a two large studies, one quantitative, one qualitative, was conducted by the uh, Institute for Reproductive Health at Georgetown University. And two key conclusions of this evaluation were, one, that the Girls' Holistic Development Strategy created spaces for dialogue and consensus building between elders, adults, and adolescents, and between men and women on social norms related to girls' holistic development. 
And secondly, that the girls' holistic development strategy has contributed to shifting social norms related to girls' education, child marriage, teen pregnancy, and FGMC. Specifically related to the level to, to grandmothers, the evaluation results revealed grandmothers increased knowledge on adolescents and on girls' holistic development issues, empowered grandmothers to take action to promote girls' holistic development in families and communities, strengthened relationships between grandmothers, girls, and mothers to create coalitions of women to protect and promote girls' holistic development, and expanded grandmothers' roles from the family to the community level to become active agents regarding FGM, girls' education, child marriage, and teen pregnancy. Um, perhaps even more convincing evidence is, I will share with you here, very short video clips from community members who participated. Female genital mutilation has been abandoned here, thanks to the grandmothers. When the grandmothers decide to stop the practice, no man could oppose their decision. It's very important to implicate the grandmothers in the fight against the exclusion and the marriage and the marriage. It's the grandmothers who are there, who take the decisions, who have to be implicated in the fight. When the grandmother is not in agreement, the marriage can't be there. Okay, and just to end with a few key lessons learned, there are many. First of all, um, our experience suggests that FGM abandonment strategy should be based on in-depth understanding initially of roles, power, and decision-making dynamics within both family and community systems. Second, that bringing about change in community norms, a, system, a systemic approach is needed that involves all categories of family and community actors. Third, that community change strategies should be based on transformative adult education approaches rather than on message-driven communication. And lastly, that grandmothers can be powerful levers for change in families and communities when an approach based on, on respect and dialogue is used with them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne and, and Judy, for, for this presentation. Um, so I, I know that at some point you quoted your colleague, Mohamedou. I don't know if Mohamedou is in, is in the room right now, and maybe that maybe you would want to, to say a few words as well and maybe complete briefly what was said during the presentation. Mohamedou, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Um, no, thank to, you. Uh, to thank Anika and Newman, Anika Newman and Judy Abel for this presentation. Thank you for all. I just I want, just want to say this uh, in our experience in the community, especially in Halpular communities, uh, they are very attention at the practice of FGM. Uh, our experience, the grandmother. Uh, as an essential role in the they, they play an essential role in catalyzing dialogue in relation related to exigent mgf and so this is they are a version of traditional values and they can perpetrate the practice if they are not involved in the uh, in the community in the activity because they uh, can perpetuate 
the practice in the community. We are understanding if they understand, if the grandmother understand uh, the practice, know the risk of this practice, whether they, if they are involved, it, I think if, uh, but they will contribute to change the norm related to the MGF. And but if they don't understand, they can they can continue to perpetuate the exclusion in the community. This I want to say because maybe uh, all of the, the presentation explained really the role of the grandmother in the community is that we don't now have very time, but I think maybe that's what I want to contribute. Thank you very much.